Hello and welcome to Education and Training. This podcast is about the United Nations. The United Nations, or UN, is an intergovernmental organisation which promotes international cooperation. The UN's goals are to keep world peace, to help countries get along, to improve living conditions for people all over the world, and to make the world a better place. Well, let's have a look why the UN was created. In order to understand why the UN was created, we need to look at events prior to the First World War. The causes of the First World War are multiple and complex. Explanations focus around two key elements, the expansion of German power and the breakdown of the system of alliances that operated within European politics. The Peace of Westphalia had created a system based on sovereignty and equal nation states, and an order was maintained by a balance of power. The balance of power game was traditionally played by the great powers. The ascendancy of Germany unsettled the balance of power and is arguably the main protagonist among several other factors that led to the collapse of the system. Germany's supremacy and rapid development led to the breakdown of order leading to the First World War. The impact of the First World War was so catastrophic due to improved technology and modern armaments that there was a realisation that war should never be used as a method for restoring order to the international system. There was a strong conviction that this time the parties had to plan a peace that would not just terminate another war but a peace that would change attitudes and build a new type of international order. The US President Woodrow Wilson viewed himself as the champion of humanity and captured the imagination of the Liberals throughout the war in nations. Wilson's 14-point plan and the attempt to create a League of Nations was the Liberalists' answer to providing a new system that would provide global order and eradicate war. Wilson sought a world revolution. His formula for peace was simple, remove reasons for government to fight through democracy and remove the means to fight through disarmament. After the First World War, the League of Nations was a place where nations could talk through their differences and avoid conflict so that another world war could be avoided. However, some states like Germany, Italy and Japan ignored the League and tried to solve their problems through using force. An example of this is Italy's invasion of Abyssinia. The League of Nations did not intervene and without US backing, the League of Nations seemed powerless. Another factor contributing to the Second World War is that the Treaty of Versailles was a dictated peace rather than a negotiated one. Not all parties were included in the negotiations and eventually nationalists in Germany rose to power and rebelled against the system leading to the Second World War. During the Second World War, the Allied powers often called themselves the United Nations united against the Axis powers and from August to October 1944 representatives from China, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom and the United States met to discuss a new United Nations in order to stop future wars and provide a platform for dialogue between states. Then in 1945 representatives of 51 states attended the United Nations Conference in order to ratify a new nation's charter. The charter was signed on the 25th of June 1945 and the UN came into existence on the 24th of October 1945.
Let's have a closer look at some of the UN's main organs. The General Assembly is the main policy making and representative organ of the UN. All 193 member states of the UN are represented in the General Assembly, making it the only UN body with universal representation. Each year in September, the full UN membership meets in the General Assembly Hall in New York for the annual General Assembly session. This is attended by many heads of state. Decisions on important questions such as admission of new members and budgetary matters require a two-thirds majority of the General Assembly, but decisions on other questions are simply down by a majority. The Security Council, which has a primary responsibility under the UN Charter for the maintenance of international peace and security. The Security Council can resort to imposing sanctions or even authorise the use of force to maintain or restore international peace and security. It has 15 members, 5 permanent members and 10 non-permanent members. The permanent members are the UK, the US, France, China and Russia. When the UN Security Council was established, it seemed sensible to award these states the power of veto on decisions. This would ensure that these powerful states remained in the UN as they could veto any decisions that they believed were contrary to their national interests. Unfortunately, this aspect has now become a major obstacle for resolving today's global problems. The major powers can often disagree on resolutions, which often result in one or more vetoes, leaving the UN Security Council powerless to intervene and resolve conflicts. The Economic and Social Council which is the principal body for recommendations on economic, social and environmental issues as well as implementing internationally agreed development goals. It has 54 members, elected by the General Assembly for overlapping three-year terms. It is the United Nations central platform for reflection, debate and innovative thinking on sustainable development of the world's poorer states. The, Tr the Trusteeship Council provided international supervision for 11 trust territories that had been placed under the administration of seven member states and ensured that adequate steps were taken to prepare the territories for self-government and independence. By 1994, all trust territories had attained self-government or independence. The Trusteeship Council suspended operations on the 1st of November 1994 by a resolution adopted on the 25th of May 1994. The Council amended its rules of procedure to drop the obligation to meet annually and agree to meet when required. The International Court of Justice is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. Its seat is at the Peace Palace in The Hague, Netherlands. It is the only one of the six principal organs of the United Nations not located in New York. The court's role is to settle, in accordance with international law, legal disputes submitted to it by states. The Secretariat it comprises of the Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, and tens of thousands of international UN staff members who carry out the day-to-day -day work of the UN as mandated by the General Assembly and the organisations of other principal organs. The Secretary General is the Chief Administrative Officer of the organisation is appointed by the General Assembly on the recommendation of the Security Council for five years and it's a renewable term. The UN staff members are recruited internationally and locally and work in duty stations and on peacekeeping missions all around the world. But serving the cause of peace in a violent world is a dangerous occupation. Since the founding of the United Nations, hundreds of brave men and women have given their lives in its service.
Well, let's have a look what the UN actually does. Well, it maintains peace and international security. UN peacekeepers are deployed to many parts of the globe. For example, an Indian peacekeeper as part of the UN's interim force in Lebanon watches over the blue line which demarcates the border between Israel and Lebanon. The UN website has up-to-date news on all of its current deployments. It promotes sustainable development. The UN is actively supporting underdeveloped nations and is trying to eradicate poverty. An initiative that supports this is the Millennium Development Goals. At the beginning of the new millennium, world leaders gathered at the United Nations to shape a broad vision to fight poverty. That vision translated into eight Millennium Development Goals, which has remained the overarching development framework for the world for the past 15 years. As we reach the end of this period, the world community has reason to celebrate. Thanks to concerted global, regional, national and local efforts, the Millennium Development Goals have saved the lives of millions and improved conditions for many more. The goals are to eradicate extreme poverty, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality and empower women, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, combat HIV and malaria and other diseases, ensure environmental sustainability and provide global partnerships for development. To protect human rights. Significantly, the UN Charter was the first treaty in history to recognise universal human rights. The UN now upholds human rights through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was established in 1948. This article contains rights such as the freedom from slavery, the right to life, the freedom from torture and the freedom from property, and there are many more. There are 30 in total which are significant human rights that belong to every human being. Part of the UN's role is to ensure that these rights are upheld all over the world. Uphold international law. International law defines the legal responsibilities of states in their conduct with each other and the treatment of individuals within state boundaries. For example, this includes such issues as human rights, disarmament, international crime, refugees migration, problems of nationality, the treatment of prisoners, the use of force, conduct of war. It also regulates the global commons such as the environment, sustainable development, regulates international waters, outer space, global communications and world trade. Also to deliver humanitarian aid. The United Nations Development Programme is the agency responsible for operational activities for natural disaster mitigation. When emergencies occur, the UNDP resident coordinators have to coordinate relief and rehabilitation efforts at the national level. The UN Refugee Agency, the UN Children's Fund and the World Food Programme have primary roles of delivery of relief assistance. So what is the future of the UN? The UN's core principles remain reinforcing state sovereignty, non-intervention in domestic affairs and the peaceful settlements of disputes avoiding the use of force. However, these principles are being challenged by tensions between national interests and shared international values, which is leading the UN to adopt a posture of applying coercive diplomacy. This has led to the emergence of international norms such as the responsibility to protect. The UN's lack of action, which permitted the atrocities in Rwanda and Srebrenica, 
are examples that have provided the UN with the rationale that coercive diplomacy is necessary to maintain peace and security for the population of the world as well as preventing state-on-state -state conflict. The role of the UN is under examination as never before. It is considered by many to be the most suitable vehicle for furthering the widening global governance agenda. But the performance of the UN in recent years, its slowness to reform, its selective involvement in humanitarian crises and its inability to respond quickly to crises, as well as its circumvention by great powers, for example the West intervention in Kosovo and Iraq absent of a UN mandate, have called into question its effectiveness. The World Summit, held at the United Nations headquarters in 2005, attempted to address these issues. The summit was an opportunity for the international community to discuss issues of development, security, human rights and reform of the United Nations. The summit recognised that development and security cannot be improved unless human rights are protected. The new norm established at the summit is the responsibility to protect, or R2P. R2P is based on the international community's obligation to protect innocent civilians from conflict when their governments fail to do so. R2P is not about taking sides in a conflict, but about protecting the innocent from all opposing factions. R2P was first implemented in the UN Security Council Resolution 1973, which sanctioned the use of force in Libya. The concept remains a sensible solution to resolving the current problem that the UN Security Council faces with the power of veto limiting the implementation of solutions. However, the intervention in Libya clearly led to a regime change and has created suspicion about the West's argument to intervene in conflict on humanitarian grounds. The summit also discussed solutions for reform in the UN. The most significant reform would be increasing the number of permanent members of the Security Council in order to provide a fairer representative of the global population. The most obvious states are Germany, Japan, Brazil and India. India being the most likely state as the largest democratic state with a nuclear capability and rising economy that would place India in a position to meet the obligations of a permanent member. If you've enjoyed this workshop then please visit education and training for more options and thank you for visiting.